My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Natalie Shalafor and Angela Lee. Environmental justice, as a framework for thinking about environmental problems, has its origins in grassroots organizing by working class and poor communities of color in the United States going back to at least the 1980s. Though the specifics have varied from place to place, this organizing has refused the practice common to mainstream environmentalism of separating questions of the environment from questions of social justice, and it has often worked to challenge the ways in which environmental harms tend to be located in places that disproportionately impact communities that are racialized and or low income. As often happens, the impressive grassroots energy of these movements caused ripples of change that went far beyond the original struggles. Their work pushed institutions to begin taking up environmental justice frameworks, including, at least in imperfect and partial ways, in some legal and policy contexts, as well as in some academic contexts. And the ripples have also extended into Canada. It's interesting that, even though Canada has no shortage of environmental racism and other forms of environmental injustice, this way of approaching issues has been considerably less common here. Certainly there are particular struggles on the ground and pockets of scholarly work that have taken it up, and it is becoming more common, but still, it remains less widespread here than in the United States. Natalie Shalafor is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa and co-director of its Center for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability. Angela Lee is a PhD student in the same faculty. Both of them are involved in environmental justice issues in their teaching and research, and both are part of a major project that focuses on exploring how the law can be used to advance the cause of environmental justice in Canada. The work of the project is organized around a number of case studies. One focuses on environmental justice as it pertains to climate change, or climate justice. That work involves, in part, studying the legal tools that might be useful to communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate change in their efforts to better understand what is happening and to address it. This includes both developing ways that existing law and policy might be mobilized, but also contributing to ongoing discussions about reforms of various sorts, including regarding the need to insert an explicit right to a healthy environment into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Another of the case studies in the project focuses on food justice, which is concerned with the many overlapping environmental and social justice concerns related to the food system from sustainable agriculture, to rampant food insecurity, to migrant farm worker organizing, and much more. This case study is happening in the context of the Canadian federal government being in the process of developing the country's first-ever national food policy. There's a lot of work happening on the ground related to food justice in Canada, but much of that work is fragmented, so one element of this case study involves contributing to efforts to bring groups and activists working on different aspects of the issue together in order to build robust networks that will allow a range of voices, including grassroots voices, to shape the conversation and hopefully the policy. They're also co-editing a book on food law in Canada and have developed a new course for law students on the topic. Natalie and Angela speak with me about environmental justice and the law in Canada in general, about their project, including the climate justice and food justice case studies, and about some of the ways in which legal work and scholarly work can be mobilized in support of frontline communities impacted by environmental injustice. My name is Natalie Shalafor, and I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa here. And I'm also the co-director of something we call our Center for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability, which is a group of profs and students who work on environmental law in Canada. I'm Angela Lee. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. 
I'm also involved with the Environmental Justice Project in the capacity of a research assistant and also the project coordinator. So I deal with the project website and the social media and things like that. I'm also really engaged with environmental justice issues in my own doctoral research. And I'm also co-teaching with Professor Heather McLeod Kilmurray, who's also involved with the project, a new course on food law here at the faculty. Environmental justice came about as a concept out of a grassroots movement in the U.S. So there was, in the 1980s, a recognition by certain communities that there were toxic waste sites and landfills and dumps being disproportionately located in communities that were racialized. And so these communities were starting to push back and saying, not in my backyard, or why is this in my backyard? And along came a very powerful grassroots movement to push back against the fact that there seemed to be this correlation between poverty, race, and environmental risks and harms of pollution. And that pushback was very much based in this grassroots movement, but then it expanded and it became a question. And people in the U.S. and then eventually in Canada started to ask themselves, well, is this a larger phenomenon? What's happening here on the ground? And there were a number of researchers doing empirical work and community activists starting to document the fact that, you know, there is a correlation here and it's not just toxic waste sites. There is a broader pattern of discrimination, essentially, discrimination against people of low income and racialized populations when it comes to environmental burdens and benefits. And so that question became bigger in the U.S. and in Canada, it has gotten some attention. But what we were interested in and some other researchers across Canada as well, we're trying to see, well, is this phenomenon at a community level happening in Canada? And we've discovered that it is happening in certain communities where certain you know, communities of color, let's say, are being affected by pollution in a disproportionate way. But particularly, we noted that it was happening with our Indigenous communities. And so you think of the example of drinking water. There's been a lot of attention paid in Canada to the fact that First Nation communities in Canada are often without clean drinking water. And in many cases, they've been that way for years, decades in some cases. That's a perfect example of an environmental injustice and an issue which needs attention in Canada. So about three, four years ago, myself and two colleagues, Heather McLeod Kilmary, who couldn't join us today, but she's another professor here in the Center for Environmental Law, as well as Professor Sophie Thériault, who's in the Civil Law Department here at the University of Ottawa. And the three of us joined together and put forward a proposal to explore basically what environmental justice means in a Canadian context, because it's something that is pretty well understood in the U.S., and while it's talked about in Canada, it hasn't really gained a lot of traction here, except in a few small pockets of academic and policy research. So we wanted to dig a little deeper on this issue and figure out particularly what the role of law is in advancing environmental justice in Canada. As academics, we're always on the lookout for research funding to answer questions, and mainly that's so that we can support amazing students like Angela here to come and do their doctoral work. And then I'd been frustrated with the extent to which the environment and the economy conversation, and it was really taking off at that time. There was a lot of interest in policy about environmental taxes and economic instruments, carbon taxes and the like. But I found that the social questions were being set aside and that there wasn't a space within which to look at how those things linked. And I was noticing that that was happening in all sorts of spheres, so not just on the climate change question, but in the question of food, where there's conversations happening about how to regulate food policy, but then there's also food insecurity and food justice issues happening alongside of them. And same thing, my colleague, Professor Terrio, was working very much on biodiversity conservation in Indigenous communities, again, looking at food security. And because the conversations weren't linked, we decided together to put this research proposal together that would give us a mandate over a number of years to dig a little deeper into some of these case studies and figure out how can you make sure that as you're advancing environmental goals, you're also making sure that you're addressing inequalities and that you're making the world a better place for people who are already vulnerable or disenfranchised in our society. Give listeners an overview of the core activities of the project. There's basically three case studies. The one that I'm leading is the climate justice case study. And then there are two other case studies, a food justice case study, which Angela can speak to. And the third one is with respect to food security, but in the north with respect to biodiversity conservation. Just to give you an example on the climate justice case study, we know that climate change is affecting everybody around the world. 
But we also know, and the science is now very clear, that the impacts of climate change are felt differently depending on who you are and where you live. And so if you look at it just in a Canadian context, we've already seen that warming patterns and climate change is happening faster in the Arctic in the north than it is in other parts of the country. And there's all sorts of good scientific explanations for why that's the case. But the reality is that warming in the north is at twice the rate it is elsewhere. And that's having huge implications for communities in the north, particularly the Inuit and other communities living up there. The permafrost is melting, it's affecting hunting of sea mammals, it's affecting all sorts of fishing patterns, migratory patterns for caribou. All of those implications are already being felt, and of course, into the future, they're going to become worse. And so one of the things that our project and my case study is looking at is, well, what legal tools do we have to, first of all, understand how that's happening, and of course, importantly, address it? And so one of the questions being asked in the project is to what extent environmental human rights can be leveraged to make sure that those communities which are being disproportionately impacted by climate change have a say and have a voice. So one of the things that I've been doing in my research is looking at the way in which the Charter, as it stands, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as it is now, whether it does protect those communities who are facing disproportionate impacts from climate change. And of course, there are also other researchers, myself included, but looking at whether the Constitution should actually be amended to include a more explicit right to a stable atmosphere and a right to a clean environment. So that's an example of the kind of work we're looking at in the climate justice case study. And Angela, talk about the food justice case study. Food is really emerging in Canada as much more of an important topic on a lot of different agendas. So we're seeing a lot of really interesting policy developments on the scene right now. For example, we see the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. He's been tasked with developing a national food policy. This is the first time that this has happened in Canada, and obviously it raises a lot of concerns about what such a policy might look like and whose voices get heard in the consultations around developing this policy and whose voices are marginalized. And there's also been consultations around a number of other different initiatives, including revisions to Canada's food guide and the healthy eating strategy, which has gained a lot of attention, marketing to children, and all of these different concerns relating to food all have implications when it comes to justice. So food justice, broadly speaking, can be described as a social concern, an economic matter, and a political problem. And it really emerged at the intersection between the environmental justice movement more broadly and also alternative food movements that were emerging at the time. So it was really a group of people from a variety of different backgrounds who were sort of mobilizing around the idea that the mainstream food system needed to address issues of social justice along all nodes of the food system from production to consumption. So there are tons of different social justice implications when it comes to the food system, like who produces the food, who has access to healthy food, who doesn't have access to healthy, nutritious, culturally appropriate food. Food insecurity remains a serious problem in Canada. And so there are all kinds of different questions that we need to be thinking about when it comes to the food system and how we can create a food system that is healthy and nutritious and equitable and sustainable for all Canadians. So there have been a couple of different initiatives that we've been working on in the context of the food justice case study. Natalie, Heather, and I are co-editing a forthcoming book on Food Law in Canada. And so there are a couple of contributions in that edited volume that deal with these kinds of questions in a number of different respects. We also played a significant role in organizing the second national conference on Canadian food law and policy. So that was held here in Ottawa in November of 2017. And so we engaged a lot of different stakeholders at that conference, including lawyers and academics and policymakers and civil society groups. And that was really a big part of the growing movement in Canada to really develop these networks and these conversations, including a lot of different voices and perspectives to really contribute to a more full analysis of the problems and what we can do in terms of the solutions. And then, of course, we have our new course that we're teaching, which is one of the first of its kind in Canadian law schools. And I think that there's really been a big push from students to see this kind of content on campuses. And there's been a lot of attention paid to issues on campus in terms of food security. There was a report produced in 2016 by Meal Exchange showing that food insecurity is a serious problem on Canadian campuses. And there are a number of student groups that are mobilizing to create change in terms of access to healthy, affordable food for students on campus. And so we've really been engaging in a lot of these different conversations and ideas through our research and our work more broadly. 
What kinds of legal tools are available to frontline and impacted communities to address environmental justice concerns? I mentioned earlier the environmental rights movement, and we could always come back to that because I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle. But another important piece, and it's very timely because we had an announcement of a revised Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, federal law, to mandate impact assessment. And one of the ways that communities can at least have more information and then with that information push back against disproportionate impacts on them is through a tool called environmental assessment. The process is intended at the outset to identify impacts you know, serious environmental impacts and also some of the social impacts. And that process is not perfect. (laughs) There have been lots of critiques of the way it's done. And one of the major critiques, especially for vulnerable communities, is the extent to which that environmental assessment regime requires the consideration of multiple impacts and cumulative effects. So one of the real criticisms of the current environmental assessment regime is that it doesn't effectively take into account cumulative impacts, cumulative effects. Let me give you a concrete example. There's a community, a First Nations community named the Anjanang First Nations. They live in an area right next to the largest concentration of chemical refineries in Canada. So basically we call it Chemical Valley. It's next to Sarnia and 40% of the chemical industry is located there right next to the very small small First Nations communities. And this community has been, of course, not surprisingly, impacted very seriously by the pollution. They are documenting a wide range of health implications, everything from a very skewed birth ratio. So there's two girls being born for every boy. And a very high proportion of the community has to use puffers. And again, a a much greater average than normal have asthma and respiratory problems and cardiac problems. And it's been heavily documented. But one of the big reasons from a legal perspective why that's taking place is that the permits being issued to all of those industrial actors in the area are being emitted without taking into account the cumulative effect. If you give a permit to one industry and that meets the standards, it's fine. But if you do it for 40 industries next to each other, of course, we're going to have serious impacts on the local airshed. So that's been a serious problem. One of the big problems that's been recognized in the food area is that a lot of great work is going on, especially in terms of civil society groups and the activism and engagement that they've been working on for so many years. But a lot of the work in the food area has been quite fragmented. And so one of the things that we're really trying to do through our work is to bring a lot of those networks together. So not only to bring together these people and these groups that may not otherwise have been able to connect, even though their interests align, but also to build the capacity of these groups to affect the kinds of changes that they want to see. So the network building is a big part of it. Knowledge mobilization and raising awareness are also two of the big initiatives that we'd like to see pushed forward in the food area. Letting people know what their rights are that they hold in relation to these issues and how they could be enforced. So whether that's through formal litigation or whether that's through extra legal channels, there's a lot of uncertainty because food is such a complex domain. And so I think just clarifying for people what the issues are, what they might be able to do about it, what networks there are in existence, what supports they have, all this kind of mobilization is really helpful in this nascent area. What would you say that scholarly work, your own or in general, can offer to communities that are impacted by environmental injustices? Maybe I can start with an example of, I guess, a few papers I've been working on with respect to the Charter. I find the situation with drinking water in First Nations communities just to be so unacceptable. And I did an analysis some time ago, a couple of years ago, which analyzed whether what was happening to those First Nations communities was actually a violation of their charter rights under Section 15, which is the guarantee to equality. The argument there was that indeed it was a violation of charter rights. Now, it wasn't a cut and dry case, and there certainly are some legal questions that are unanswered, and the courts would have to be willing to be flexible in their interpretation of certain parts of the Section 15 test. But I concluded that it was a violation of their Section 15 rights. Of course, you publish it and it goes out in journals, but who knows how many people read those journals. So I sent it out as much as I could to some of the people working on the front lines in this, and there's a case going forward in Alberta now. And I've always been motivated to do research on things that are very much related to policy in the moment. So, uh, you know, you hope that your analysis and your research might get taken up by a court who's faced with the question, 
and that it might contribute favorably to environmental justice in that way. I think there is a really close relationship between theory and practice. So theory is continuing to inform practice and practice continually informs theory. And you would hope that better knowledge can really contribute to crafting better solutions. And I think that all of us in the work that we do, even if it might just be research and writing sitting at our desks, We really do our research with a practical orientation. So we're constantly thinking about what the practical implications of this kind of research might be and how it might best be utilized and mobilized, not only by other academics and by courts, but also by more frontline workers and by communities that are really dealing with these issues on the ground. So a part of that also is ensuring that our research is widely accessible. So even though our traditional audience might be scholarly journals and books that are usually just situated in libraries, and things like that. We also do make efforts to mobilize our research via more public-facing mediums like op-eds to make sure that the knowledge that we're generating is accessible to a broader audience and in terms that they can understand and relate to. I asked earlier about what tools the law offers to impacted communities, but now turn that around and talk about what the law doesn't and can't do to address environmental injustices. That's an interesting question because I think in some respects the law maybe should be there to help solve some of these questions. But one of the issues is access to justice. When you have communities like Adjanang First Nations, or we we haven't talked about it, but the grassy Narrows First Nations up in the north that's been struggling with mercury contamination for decades, they are often hamstrung in their ability to provide the evidence to show disproportionate impact. And often that evidence comes in the form of health studies. So it has been a huge fight for some of these communities to get the governments and stakeholders to invest the resources necessary to document the health impacts. Because anecdotally, you know that in this community, people are sick and you'll have doctors in the media saying, yes, you know, I've been up to the Fort Chippewan community in Alberta downstream of the oil sands. And yes, these people are sick. They're experiencing disproportionate impact. But when you try to bring that into a courtroom, the courts are looking for a kind of evidence that is very robust and that is based on a certain kind of science. And so if those communities don't have the resource to document that, then their cases aren't going to be strong enough to go forward. That's a really key part of the puzzle in terms of making sure these communities have access to justice, making sure that there is good on the ground data that we're measuring, we're monitoring impacts of contamination and that we're measuring the health implications, not just on a short term, but over the long and the medium term as well. The question of access to justice is a really important one, and it really underlines the fact that even though there may be legal solutions to these problems, who can actually access those legal solutions is a really big question which is why the environmental justice movement is more than about just law. It's also inherently political in that it demands fair treatment and meaningful involvement for all stakeholders, regardless of how they're situated, and especially for those who tend to be marginalized. So in the food area, there's a lot of different ways in which disproportionate impacts are borne unevenly. So the case of migrant workers is one that immediately comes to mind. This is one of the major issues that we tried to deal with at the conference as well. There was a lawyer, Shane Martinez, who deals with these issues. He's based out of Toronto, but he gave a presentation about migrant workers and their plight and the ways in which law doesn't serve them in the best way possible. And so obviously raising awareness of these issues as a political problem is one way in which these groups who are disproportionately affected can potentially have better access to the legal solutions that should otherwise be at their disposal. So based on your work in this project, what key reforms at the level of policy or law do you think would be important goals to push for? There's some really exciting work happening right now in the amendments to SEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. That act has been under revision, and there was a standing committee report over the summer, which had a huge series of recommendations, including bringing environmental justice very, very much into the language of the act, so that when toxins are being evaluated, when permits are being issued, when standards are being developed, that we take into account this potential for disproportionate impacts of certain communities. So bringing it directly into legislation in terms of the evaluation is really, really important. The cumulative effects piece is huge. And maybe last but not least is the environmental rights movement. 
It's a huge movement taking place. We have over 150 municipalities in Canada that have signed on to say that they believe that Canadians have a right to a healthy environment. There are several provinces that have legislation that recognizes a right to a healthy environment. And what we need now is we need both federal law and the Charter to recognize it explicitly. So a lot of my work has been arguing that implicitly in our Charter, we actually recognize the right to a healthy environment through our right to life, liberty, and security of the person in Article 7, and also through Section 15, the guarantee to equality. But I, among many other activists and scholars in Canada, would like to see an explicit right to a healthy environment in our Constitution. We're in the minority. The majority of the countries around the world do recognize it in one way or another, and so we should be joining them. There was some very interesting work done a few years ago by a professor at University of British Columbia, David Boyd, and he did empirical research looking at what happened in countries that did have an explicit recognition of an environmental right, and he found a direct correlation between improved environmental outcomes and health outcomes for those communities in those countries and access to justice as well. So there is an empirically justified argument that having an explicit right to a healthy environment will lead to change on the ground. I certainly think that in cases such as we see with First Nations drinking water, with the Anjanang First Nation, the Grassy Narrows First Nation, the Fort Chippewan in Alberta, these communities that have been faced with really, really frighteningly, shockingly bad environmental harm and have been without a legal remedy for that for years, I think a charter right would change that. And so I think just for those communities, it's important of itself, but it would also be important for Canada as a whole. So in the food area, we're actually seeing the government engage in a lot of public consultation on a lot of the initiatives that they're moving forward with. But I guess the question that remains to be seen is how meaningful that consultation will be and how much of that will actually be taken into account in the end result. You would hope that they really take that public consultation seriously and that the concerns of marginalized groups are heard and taken seriously, but we still have to see where things pan out in terms of that. You have been listening to my interview with Natalie Shalafor and Angela Lee about environmental justice and the law in Canada. To learn more about their work, go to environmentaljustice.ca. That's environmentaljustice.ca. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. <laughs>